Yes, hello everyone, my name is Sara and I come here from the University of Tampere where I actually just started in September, so before that I've been in Helsinki for 10 years, so it's a bit like coming home <laughs> to be here in Helsinki. And I'm going to speak to you about research that I've done partly during my PhD research, so on the basis of my thesis, and part of it is from the postdoc that I have been doing after. I defended my thesis about two years ago. And um, part of the work I'm doing now is actually on material that is rather sensitive, and so I wasn't able to include this in the talk because this is videotaped and on the internet, and I'm currently um, interviewing people who have a refugee background about their situation, and part of that material is, is, is difficult to share and difficult to anonymize. So, so I decided for this that I'm going to leave, leave that out and speak more about the, the policies, but also a little bit about the experiences of people who who um, are affected by these policies. Um, so the main kind of um, argument that I'm making in this talk is that uh, immigration policy and the way that it's implemented creates, builds on and also upholds gendered notion of family life. And I will come back to, back to this in, in which way this happens. But so the basic idea is that um, politicians, for example, or the immigration officer, they don't just pick kind of understandings of what families should be like that exist, but they also shape them. So we, we have kind of both. We have existing understandings in society that are part of these processes, but then also by expecting families to be, behave a certain way in order to, for example, be allowed to bring your partner into, into the country, we, we kind of create understandings of what a marriage should be like, what a family means, do grandparents belong to the family, these questions that, that become crucial there. Um, so the, the structure of this talk will be that I will first give you, because for some of you the kind of whole understanding what, what is family reunification, what does it actually mean, might not be so familiar, so I'm going to give you some background. And then I have kind of three main, main um, subject matters that I'm going to discuss. One are dependencies that are um, um, present when transnational family life is governed by policy. And then we have the gender roles that are present in this and then notions of masculinity and fatherhood that I'm going to talk about separately. And um, quickly, some of the kind of theoretical notions that I'm, I'm using in my work, one is the one on intersectionality, so the understanding that we have um, several um, interlocking systems that work together, for example, understandings of gender, sexuality, class, age, and that they don't work separately from each other, but they work together. And then notions of citizenship, gendered citizenship and cultural citizenship, then um, moral gatekeeping. I won't have time to explore this further if you're interested, then <laughs> here are the references. And then the understanding of bordering, so that borders which are not only physical demarcations, lines between nation states, but that's an ongoing process of um, inclusion and exclusion that goes on even in everyday life for some people. Um, so the data that I've been uh, analyzing and that I'm using, and this also kind of shows the process how it works. So this is uh, minutes from the from the parliament, parliamentary minutes that I've analyzed, and the parliament of course uh, makes the law. So the Aliens Act that defines who can enter the country, who cannot, which which is passed by by the parliament, and then implement, implementing that law is, is done by the immigration office and partly also by the police, and they then either grant a residence permit when someone applies to, when for example, um, someone from another country is married to Finn and they want to get a residence permit for this non-EU foreigner, they apply and then they either get the permit or they don't. And if they don't, they can then complain at the administrative court, at the local administrative court, for example, in Helsinki, at the Helsinki court. And um, the court either then returns the decision to the immigration office or then they reject the appeal. And then you can take it to the higher administrative court. And then there are analyzed media discourses. So I've looked at court cases for my, for my research. I've interviewed immigration officers and police people. I've looked at the immigration law and how this has changed over time since the 90s until today. I've looked at parliamentary debates from the 90s until today. And I've looked at media debates in, in Helsinki Sanomat and some other media too. So this is kind of showing the process, but also showing the research. And now, as I said, I'm, I'm talking to people who are 
in the process of applying for family reunion. But this is a very recent research that I'll just mention quickly in connection to fatherhood especially. So some background, who uh, can bring a family to Finland or who, who is allowed to even apply for family reunion? So we have marriage as the basis, you can bring your married partner, or cohabitation. So if you have lived together for a minimum of two years, then you can also bring your partner. Um, then children under 18, at least um, when the parents are in Finland and the children are abroad, if they are under 18, they at least officially have the right to join their parents. And then the legal guardians of children under 18. So if someone comes here as a minor to Finland, but the parents are abroad, they at least legally have the right to bring them. The problem is at the moment that in effect, unaccompanied minors hardly ever get their families to Finland. And that the argument is often that family life does not exist anymore because they have been separated for quite a while and then the families aren't able to unite. And this is actually a big problem. Another thing I have to mention is family reunification is often discussed in connection to refugees and asylum seekers. And of course, that is an important issue. But it's actually over 80% of the decisions that are made on family reunion are for non-refugee people. So are the foreigners who live in Finland or Finnish people who are having a partner from abroad. So we have to remember that this whole phenomenon of family reunion is not only a refugee phenomenon, um, but kind of much broader. But especially these unaccompanied asylum seekers are, have been in the media and this has been discussed because the situation is, of course, is extremely difficult. Um, another thing that has been in the media recently much, there's of course a lot of other regulations I won't be able to go through here, but one uh, regulation that has been mentioned a lot is this income requirement, which is rather high. Um, so before, if you had a refugee background, you could bring your family without having to show a certain income, but now after three months, so if you don't file the application in the first three months, then you have to prove a certain income. And for a family of two children and one adult, this income is 2,600 after taxes. So that's more than 4,000 euros a month that you have to earn, which is quite a big amount of money, as, as we probably all agree. And people who have just moved to Finland, of course, yeah, have very big difficulties earning so much money. And this was actually helping in San who then when this was implemented in 2016, this law, they made a story about it and, said, and they calculated the median income of many professions like veterinarians, graphic designers, actors, nurses, coders, teachers, and realized that all of them would not earn enough to bring one partner and two children to Finland. So actually this exclude, excludes quite a big group of people who will then not be able to reunite with their family. Yeah, there's a lot of other things about the requirements, but I won't be able to go into them in more detail. Um, but actually, like maybe one thing I should mention is one thing is that the requirements are, are tough. The other one is that many people can't even leave the applications. So leaving the applications in the first place is difficult because you have to legally reside in the country where you leave the application and you have to leave the application in the nearest embassy. So in your own country, and for many countries, especially if there's war and conflict, there is no Finnish embassy. So you have to travel to Turkey or to India from Afghanistan, for example, to India, where the nearest Finnish embassy is and then yeah, to get a visa there, to have the money to travel there. Some people are not allowed to, to not, yeah, so this process is also difficult. So it's also important to, um, to mention that it's not only getting the permit, it's also leaving the application that can be difficult for some. Yeah, so what does immigration policy and also discourses and discussions about families and family reunion, what, what processes are at work there? And as I said, I will speak about dependency. So why dependency and, and, and in what way does it work? So I'm, I, I argue that there's actually three ways in which immigration law dependency and, and family reunion link together. And that immigration law actually tries to prevent dependency. It requires dependency and it also causes dependency. And this is a bit weird. Like why does it aim to prevent it? It requires it and it causes it. It sounds a bit counterintuitive to have all of these at work at the same time. I will shortly tell you how this works. So it aims to prevent, and this has to do with the income requirement I just told you about. So the, the idea behind that is that actually, or at least that's what um, immigration officers and politicians say, the idea behind is to prevent people to become dependent on the Finnish welfare state. So if you have enough income that you can provide for your family, then these family members won't need assistance from, from the kind of public system in that way. So here the dependency is kind of the welfare dependency that you try to prevent through income. But how, how is dependency required if, if we are preventing it? Why are we crying? Well, this is a different form of dependency. And this has to do, first of all, with the underage people. Because, of course, if you're under 18, the idea is that you're dependent on your, on your parents. You need them. And that's why 
because this dependency relation is something that the law protects. But another thing is for older, um, so for example, if you have, if you are an adult and you have your own parents who are old somewhere in another country, then it is really, really hard to get them to come to Finland, almost impossible. But there is one part of the law that says if they are totally dependent on the family member in Finland, there has been some prominent cases of, for example, one Russian grandmother that had Russian family here in Finland. And they had to prove that she is totally dependent on her children here, that there's no other way that she can survive in Russia. And then it, it would be possible, but it was actually a very, very long process. And at the end, it had to go to the European court. And yeah, so it's not easy, but there the dependency is still required. So in which way is dependency caused then? Well, this has to do with the fact that if you are marrying, so for example, if you move to Finland as, as, as um, from, let's make up some country, let's say I come from Chile and I come to, to Finland and I'll marry a Finnish, Finnish man. And uh, this, my residence permit is tied to this Finnish man for four years. And after four years, I'm able to individually apply to my own kind of permanent residence permit. And this dependency, this way I'm very dependent on that Finnish partner. And in the cases of domestic violence, if, if there's violence in the, in the marriage, that can be really, really devastating for many, that they are too afraid to leave their partners because they are scared that they would otherwise lose their residence permit. So in this way, immigration law also causes dependency because it makes people dependent on their family members and on their married partners, which can have devastating effects. Um, yes, and then about the gender roles. So actually, um, here I'm going to talk about um, the court cases. So we, we looked with my colleagues, Johan Lehmann and I, we looked together at court cases from the Helsinki Administrative Court and how the couples and their lawyers, how they argue. So this was marriages between Finns and foreigners and how they argue why they should be allowed to come to Finland. So they've gotten a negative decision. They take it to court. And now they say, why, why is this a real marriage? Why should this be like a real, in quotation marks, of course, all the marriages were real, but to convince the immigration officers that this should be a marriage that is a basis for residence permit. And here what we found was, interestingly, that they um, activated certain understandings of, of gendered married life and of how, how to behave in a family. So one was that um, the women were talked about as good carers. So, for example, the Finnish person would say, well, my, my wife from Thailand, she's a much better carer for my children, even if, if more affectionate and and more loving than, than the biological Finnish mother is. And, and she's such an important carer for my kids. She should be able to stay. So the woman is carer. Well, that's not very surprising. That's quite a kind of well-known <laughs> role that women have been traditionally ascribed. But actually, what we also found was uh, fathers as carers. So we also had many cases where the couples and their lawyers stated um, the father is such, or the, the man is such an important father figure to my children, even if it's not the biological father that he can't be deported. You know, he should stay here because he's, he's such a good carer, he's such a good dad. So we had good mothers or mother figures and good father figures. Then, of course, also rather traditional is the understanding of a male provider. So in several cases, and we have to stress that for Finnish couples, there's no income requirement. So they didn't say this because they have to pay a certain amount of money, but they said this to convince the authorities. They said, he's such a great provider for the family, he works, gives us all his money, does everything to care for the family, so that's why they should stay. But what is missing here? Women as providers. So there was no single case in which the couple would say, oh, you know, she goes to work, she, she, she has, she's such a great provider for the family, that's why she should stay. So interestingly, we had quite kind of traditional understandings of how men and women should behave in a marriage that were activated by the couples and by their lawyers when they made these appeals. Um, and another kind of a gendered understanding that we find um, in, in kind of family reunification has to do with age and gender. So here, what we found was that there were, um, yeah, in general, maybe I would say at the beginning that um, when I talked about this total dependency, you know, that these elderly people have to say that they're totally dependent on the Finnish, Finnish family member, they have to see whether they're how sick the person is, if there's health care in the country, if there's elderly care in the country. And I argue in one of my publications that here the aging body becomes a site of bordering practices so that you look at the aging parent and at their biological state in order to evaluate whether or not they should be able to come to Finland. Um, but then um, in these grandmother cases that we found that, the, that were in the media um, a couple of years ago, this was an Egyptian and a, fin and a Russian grandmother, the, the argumentation is because they were women and they were old, um, they deserve 
kind of care by their parents, you know, by their fam by their family members. So it was argued that these should be taken care of by their children. These are kind of they have done their own work and they are old now, and now the kids should be able to care for them. So they should be allowed to come. In the public debate, that was kind of discussed around them. But then interestingly, we had elderly women from Russia who moved to Finland, um, also in the court cases, and they married a Finnish man. Um, and the expectation but then was, no, they're not moving to Finland because they want to be with a Finnish husband. They're moving to Finland because they want to be with their other family members. So they had kids and grandkids in, in Finland. And the argumentation by the immigration um, office and also by the courts was that these are not really women who come to Finland because they want to marry a Finnish man, but because they were older and they were women, the expectation was that either they are coming to Finland to care for their grandchildren or that their daughters who lived in Finland would be caring for them. So we had these gendered care expectations that were present in these cases. So the last way in which kind of gender and um, understandings of, of gendered family lives are present when, when family life is regulated um, is in relation to fatherhood and masculinity. Um, so here when I talked to the immigration officers and I looked at my, at my interview data and I tried to look, okay, how do they talk about men in general, about migrant men, what's the kind of main thing that was discussed there? And actually the, any, every example in which a man featured was always about someone who was trying to misuse the system. So it was being said like, oh, they try to cheat a Finnish woman and pretend that they are in love in order to get a residence permit or some other ways in which kind of men were kind of trying to, to work around the system. And this has been actually studied in, in Great Britain and in other European countries. This is a very common notion of this kind of migrant men as a kind of, kind of quite negative notion of, of masculinity here. But when it comes to fatherhood, we look now, and this is very recent work I've done actually, uh, an article that we just now submitted, where we looked at the um, uh, administrative, what is it, Korke Hallinto Oikeus, now I'm missing the word, Supreme Administrative Court, probably? Yeah, uh, at court cases there. And um, what was interesting was, and what was devastating to read was, that it was in many cases quite easy to say that, oh, we are separating now the children from the father, but I mean, they can be in touch through other means. They don't have to live together. They don't have to see each other all the time. So kind of separating kind of the mothers from their children was seen as kind of much more problematic, but separating fathers from their children when the fathers were deported or got a negative decision was um, not seen as problematic. And kind of it was always argued that, well, they can Skype. And if we compare that to, for example, Finnish cases where you have custody issues when parents get divorced. You always stress how it's so important for children to have contact with both parents, you know. And of course, if you look at the best interest of the child, it would be the, in, in the best interest of the child to be in touch with both parents. But in these cases that have to do with family reunion, this kind of contact with the fa father is easily dismissed and said, oh, well, no, it's not that important. Well, so how about the, the migrants themselves? And the interviews I've now been doing um, are mostly with men because the majority, of course, of those who are now here as, as, as uh, refugees are, many of them are men, and their families are in another country. And um, what has to do with their fatherhood and their role as a parent, there are, of course, certain expectations that they themselves have, how they, as a father, should provide for the family, for example, financially, which can be really difficult. Um, and also that they are really worried about the security of their children who might be somewhere in a transit country, somewhere in a refugee camp, and they feel that they, as parent, they have caused the situation. They have left them. Now they're alone somewhere. They can't go to school somewhere in Turkey where they're waiting to progress, hopefully, to Finland. And this kind of uncertainty of not knowing how long the separation from their family will last um, and not knowing what the future will bring because the immigration offices and the decisions, they are very... Yeah, they don't tell you, oh, you know, we'll get you, you will get a decision in so and so many days. You have to just wait. And then this ongoing separation and not being able to influence your own future or your family's future, that weighs on, on very many of the people that I've talked to. And, and actually many of them um, have, uh, yeah, have quite uh, severe symptoms of, I mean, I'm not a doctor, so I can't give them a diagnosis, but it seems that they are going through mental, mental health issues just because they, they, they are so worried about, about their family situation, about the fact that they have been separated for so long and with the... Regulations getting tighter and tighter, it's not getting more easy, and, and, and this uncertainty is what many, many kind of have a problem with. 
Yeah, so this was uh, what I said at the beginning would be the main main point of the talk, so I thought I'd repeat it. So if you don't remember anything else from this, <laughs> then uh, then you remember hopefully this main point that um, we have, uh, again, I repeat that the immigration policy and the implementation of it creates notions of gendered family life. And how it creates it is, for example, by saying that, um, well, if you behave this in this way, then we believe that you are actually husband and wife, and oh, you don't live together. Oh, in this, it, we had actually some cases where someone was studying in another town and working in another, and they only saw each other on weekends. And that was suddenly seen as not okay because you have to live together all the time. So all these kind of regulations on how you should live your married life that for Finnish families don't exist kind of create this understanding of what a family life should be. And it builds on, on, on existing understandings like I, I, with this kind of provider and carer and these, these understandings, but also these kind of gendered care expectations that grandmothers should care for their children and all that. So, um, so in this way, I would argue is immigration policy and its implementation kind of both creating and, and, and building on these notions. This is my, my thesis and the article, it's an article PhD, so that these are the articles that the thesis is based on. Um, this was the, the one on the court cases that I discussed and this is the one on the interviews with the immigration offices, and this is on the media analysis, and this is the um, parliamentary minutes. And then just if you are interested in this and in my work, <laughs> um, part of what I talked about is also from newer research of mine. So these first three articles um, are at the moment in, in the kind of review process that I have submitted or that are kind of soon forthcoming. And then the last four have been published this year and especially this kind of aging body as a bordering side is, is, is one that this presentation is, is based on. But there's also other work that I've done on other topics since then, in case you're interested. Thank you. <laughs>